This is, as I say, the maximum stuff we can do minimally invasively. Some of you may not call it minimally invasive. Um, disclosures, all my disclosures, I do get royalties on some of the products you're going to see, both into body and uh, post instrumentation. Uh, so, I mean, we got so many strategies today, right? You, all these things you guys have seen and heard. You can take Axe Lift completely off the books. We'll never use it again for deformity. I just put it there and you'll see why in a few minutes. But I think all these techniques are totally available. It's hard to go through every one of them. But it's a question of choosing what you need for deformity. And today, literally every single deformity, whether it's five degrees or 120 degrees is the maximum we've ever done, we can do. As long as they're flexible and stiff. This is important. Rigid is fused. If it's fused, you're not talking about it. These are patients that are flexible or stiff. It doesn't move on bending films. It doesn't matter as long as it's not fused. So that's the first indication, right? Then you select, obviously, medical comorbidities. You got to plan the whole thing out like someone like uh, someone talked about it. Really important MIS. It doesn't change. Then choose what technique. From the list of techniques we had, choose what works best for that patient and in your hands, and then obviously execute it, right? So these things all fall in place. So we have a very strict stage protocol for this. It's the same protocol for every patient. Once again, whether it's one degree or 120 degrees, nothing changes. What changes is the little nuances for that particular patient. And it's worked really well for us literally for the last six years. So let's start with this patient, right? Classic female retired singer, severe back pain, six years, progressive deformity, severe back pain, leg pain, intact neuro, tried everything on the surface of the earth. And for me, a red line on a good patient is when they start taking narcotics. They're clearly going overboard. They've gone fine for three, four, five years. Now they're just managing the narcotics. That to me is a red line. You gotta start talking to them. I think they're better off getting surgery than getting being on narcotics forever. And then Forteo for a year, we thought is neuromuscular, got it checked out. It's not neuromuscular. This was clearly a collapsing degenerative deformity. Now every patient gets all this. If they don't get it, I don't do it. It's, these are all important facts. All get a whole spine x-ray. We measure every single parameter we need to measure, right? They all get an MRI. MRI is for stenosis to know where it is. Look at L5S1, do you need to do it or not? The UIV is based on the first parallel normal disc. Even if it's 12-1, I'll stop at one. If it's absolutely normal on the MRI, it's parallel and neutral, and we got many of them. So you just don't go to T10 and it gets tall. But more important, look at the vascular and renal anatomy. It's staring at you. Look at the bifurcation like we talked about. Look at where it's splitting. Look at the high-rising cells. Make sure 4 5 is 4 5, not a 5 1, anatomically. But these things matter. It's not a high-rising cells, but everything will move with it. So you got to study the anatomy. They all get a CT scan. Any suspicion, it's fused. Some of them are so degenerated, you almost think the facets may be fused in the back. So I have no hesitation getting a CT scan. It does two things. You see gas on the disc, you know that's going to open up. You see a vacuum phenomenon, that thing's gonna completely open up on you. It's a very good sign. And then make sure the facet's not fused in the back. That's really important. If facet's fused in the back, you'd be stupid trying to do a lateral. You will break and fracture everything. It won't work. So these are small things. And you cannot see it on x-ray. And bending films are obsolete in this technique. It's so useless, you don't even do it. You're gonna get nothing out of it. But patient will not bend. It hurts like hell. It tells you nothing. What you want to know really is, is it fused in the back or not? That's what, so we've completely stopped doing bending films. And bone density is really critical. If your T-score is less than minus three, I won't do it. Put them on for a day, let them come back a year later, and then see where we are and sort of do it as long as you're doing all right. If they're between two and three, we'll do it and start for a at the same time and, co and continue for a year. That's worked really, really well for us. Again, this is like eight years now. We'll, and you just give for a along with it and let them get it less than two is fine. So that's, that's the pre-op. She's 51 degrees PILL mismatch. These are as severe as they get, PI 57. Lumbar lordosis is almost kyphotic, right? So this is where she is. These are her parameters. That's her MRI, obviously stenotic. 5-1 is bad. Now we start looking up. These just start looking good. But if we go back to the AP, that's in the coronal plane, in the carb angle. So you still got to do it. Remember, first, parallel, normal disc. You can't stop at the apex because it's parallel. So you gotta take both into consideration of where you need to go, and there's a CT scan. Now a CT scan again, over the gas, I told you, you know these things are gonna open up, they're really good. But look at three, four. Three, four looks almost fused. Look at three, four, both planes, that's fused. That's not coming in the lateral. So you gotta get ready for that. Now, I might try doing it, but more than likely not. You know that's not gonna come, it's fused. It's, so it doesn't matter though, if you look at the protocol, you're working below and above, and you're still gonna get a global correction. 
So that's how you plan that out, and this is a three-fourths fuse. So now you can see that again, three-fourths pretty much fuse there, if you look at that, but you're gonna correct globally, right? And here's the, here's the CT scan, your bone density is minus 1.4 or something at the hip. Don't look at the spine, look at the hip for bone density. Your score is way off the charts, ODI is 60. And so we look at the alignment goals, right? You know, PI is 51. You want to at least bring it to 40. You need 40 degrees of lordosis now. We know that. You need the SVA to come to almost 15 millimeters, centimeters less than where that is. And you want to bring the PT to 25. So you got your goals from what you have. And, and this is the protocol I talked to. We do we stage it. We'll do all the laterals, all the anti soas laterals on day one. From 5-1 all the way up, I'll show you in a minute. Let them up, get them up and walking. The leg pain's gone. You know you got indirect decompression clinically. It doesn't matter what MRI looks like. They have no leg pain and they get up and walk. They go to the floor. And then Wednesday we get another standing x-ray and that's really changed the protocol a lot in terms of how much you need to do posteriorly. So much so, I'll show you in a minute, we're not doing, doing T2 to pelvises. The only time we're going up now is there's a thoracic kyphosis that's after you've done the laterals which is more than 60 degrees, then you may want to consider going up. But very rarely ever you need to go back up there. So lots of things have changed in 2011. I've not gone trans in 2011. It's all anti sewers The cages have become much bigger. They're all 12 degrees or higher. Absolutely do not do axillip anymore. I think it's an absolute travesty. And I'll say it, I stood here and spoke on axillip on this very podium. Don't do it for deformity. Not worth it. Contouring the rod becomes really critical. You got to bend it, rotate it. There's a whole lot on rod contouring and reduction, which no one talks about. There's a, there's a whole other technique for that. And that's equally important. 30% correction comes from there. The other thing, we know how much we can get from these cages. You get incremental eight degrees of lordosis with each of these 12 degree cages at each level as you go up. But you get more at four, five, and five, one, obviously. And you get more if you place it anteriorly. So all these matter. You put the cage posteriorly, you're getting nothing. So everything matters where you place it. It should be placed anterior, and maybe middle will get away, 12 degree at least cages, and maximize at four, five, and five, one. So you're working that to get your sagittal balance. That's not the issue. So, and you get about eight degrees on an average with each of these cages. So think of how many levels you're doing, right? So there you go. I know I can get 20 degrees in an A-lift. Anyone doing an A-lift can get 20 degrees at five, one. You do a good A-lift, right? So you'll get 15 to 20 degrees at four, five, and you start getting 10, 15 degrees at each level as you go up. You made your 40 degrees already if you plan this right and you put them right and place them right. And as I said, we all go, we go pre sewers today, I've completely stopped going anti sewers It is a clean plane there. And I hope to show you videos. I call it the lumbar ACDF. You feel the aorta, you don't, you don't go dissecting the carotid and ACDF. We know where it is. You feel it, you go down, you saw fantastic films right now without ever seeing the carotid. And yet you saw things go down. So why is it any different here? The aorta is way bigger. You can feel it on the left side. It's very clear. And you just go next to it. You can feel it with your hands. So it's all about knowing the anatomy, studying it where it is, and there's a clean plane there. So we talked about the upper. These are the incisions, right? The bottom one is the 5-1 right here. This is 3, 4, and 4, 5. And 1, 2, and 2, 3 is right there. 1, 2, and 2, 3, you can go pre or trans so It's not that much a problem. But this is how we mark the incisions usually, we said. And then we generally start doing it. So let me you know, switch to um, the video here, and hopefully you can, you guys can see some of the. Oh, let me run from that. Just lateral to the linear elbow, rectus, rectus sheath. You pop in there, and you're going to separate the muscles right there. Just lateral to the rectus sheath. Once you pop that, you pretty much get down into the transversalis fascia. We'll let that run a little bit. You'll see clean fat coming from the retroperitoneal space. At this point, you sort of open that up, and this is where the sponge stick becomes really useful. Use a sponge stick and reach back. This is the older five one. It's a one inch incision, take a sponge stick now, reach back, you're seeing the peritoneal sac and transfer salus, reach to the iliac crest, and so start sweeping out everything towards you. And you start sweeping over the psoas all the way down. Uh, you see the beginning of psoas right there. You saw that right? That's actually a psoas tendon there. And you start seeing, you'll see the ureter now that moves with the peritoneal sac. There's the ureter, which in a second you'll see it. It usually comes up with, that's the ureter right there. It moves with the peritoneal sac and moves over and comes right, then that retract, that's the psoas right there, the three retractors we talked about, and there's your disc. So if you plan it in the bifurcation, actually it's a very easy approach. Just to show you where the vein is, that's gonna lift up a little bit, there's your vein on the vessel, just pull it back up, keep it out of your way. And you're not mobilizing at all, you're literally falling in the plane that's there and using that areolar tissue to get you to the disc at 5-1, you know on X-ray where you are. At this point, it's an A-lift in the lateral position. 
It's the same operation we've done for years, except you're looking laterally rather than looking straight down. That's the only difference here. You then work your disc like you normally would work your disc, and then basically you do your discectomies. But I now do your um, what do we need to do to get? I'll just, I'll just go to the prosthesis in a minute. That's where the slight change. These are dilators that go up, eight, ten. I'm usually going all the way to 16 millimeters and 18 degrees for a deformity like this with such big sagittal imbalance. And you'll see it. It's working the disc. Keep working it. Release the PLL. That's like one of the most critical aspects of any a -lift. It, it shocks me. People put 24 degree cages with the PLL still closed. All you're doing is this. You're fish mounting the thing. That's why you get stenosis. If you release the PLL, come right up. Did you go in with the keras and, and, and resect no, it? You'd use a curb curette and go small curb okay. curette behind the back of S1 and just release it. One level. It's an old trick we learned from disc replacements. So that's, those are trials. These trials, you can see, has got an angle to it. They have an angle that helps you insert it. If you turn around, it has a little angle that comes out. That's a 16 millimeter, 18 degree cage. I find that the most useful. Anything beyond that, the end plates don't meet. You get point loading in front. I very rarely do 24 degrees, but a 16 millimeter, 18 degree cage I found extremely useful. It, you get more than enough lordosis. You get 25 degrees of lordosis from this. The cage does not determine what lordosis you get. I'm going to say this to my dying day. We published it too. If you can. Try sticking a 16, 18 millimeter, 18 degree cage in L12. You'll get three degrees. Try it, it won't work. It'll collapse on the way down. It doesn't work. You gotta figure out where you're gonna use it. It works at four five and works at five one. The prosthesis again has got all that like we talked about and it comes with the handle. I, I like it with the handle and the plate. We rig it up that way before putting it in. So I'm not worried about putting the screws and anything jamming on me. The screws go right through that hole. They are completely protected and so all those retractors are attached to the Thompson frame we talked about, and your four screws go in, and this is entirely locked in place. And that uh, that finishes sort of your five one uh, in terms of where we are. We'll go one more quick here, and then that should open that up. So you put those four screws in, and then once then everything just comes off. Your plate is fixed to it, and it's basically final tightening. And you put the top capping whatever that block is there, and you're pretty much done with five one. So once that is done, you're pretty much now moving on to Four five that's sitting right there, and now I'll just can I how do I come back to the screen? Here we go. <laughs> no, how do we come back here now? I'll go to the next one here, Dr. Nan. Do you see any difference in the retrograde ejaculation from the lateral A list versus the no? It shouldn't be any difference, the incident should be exactly the same. I mean, we got some really good guys, we haven't seen it honestly. I, I've always said for years, I think it's the mobilization, the less you mobilize. And the more you use anatomical corridors, you're not going to have a problem. The more you start mobilizing stuff around, that's where things happen. We mobilize really little. It's planned that way. Like I said before, if I have somebody who's not in the bifurcation, I won't do this. I'd rather do, if I'm going to do an ALF, I'll do it supine. We can, everyone's comfortable mobilizing things around. And if there's a problem, you can take care of it. But luckily, 95%, you got the bifurcation in your favor. So choose it carefully. What's that MRI? But personally, can you do it? Of course, you could do a lateral. It just makes it more difficult. And then you land up with a tear, you're going to suture in a lateral position. So that's where your vascular guy needs to be important. It's not doing it. Any one of us can do this approach. Are you willing to fix the tear? And there will. That vein can come down. It'll pop. The left vein. It sometimes slips on you. You've got to watch it. And that's why that retractor is really important with a lip on it that keeps that vein up there. But that wants to slide down on you. So this now is the approach for 2.5. So let me just get into that. There we go, beautiful. Is that coming up? Uh, okay. Uh, oh, sorry, I gotta move it there. Sorry, forget that one. I'm on 100 videos here. Here we go. Okay, so that's a 2 5. You're opening it up and let that run. Uh, this is obviously a video of just the 4 5, but it gives you the idea. In a minute, I'll show you how we connect the two. And so that's 4 5. Go right down. If you're just doing 4 5, 3 4, we'll get both through that same incision, one inch incision that's external oblique being incised. It's uh, it's all fingers, a lot of finger dissection. Split it along its fibers, get the external oblique incised, and go down, find the internal oblique, split along the internal oblique fibers. And once you've done that, then it's your finger going back again. That's internal oblique being, you're going right between the plane of the internal oblique. And then once you've done that, you're popping into the transfer lasso to the iliac crest, sweeping all the way posterior and anterior from both sides. Then you go straight down, you'll feel the source and just move everything off the soles. You can clearly feel it. 
The danger to most beginners is you go behind the cells and hook it. Don't do that. It's pretty superficial. Be careful. If you go right down and start feeling the spine, invariably I find people hook the cells and pulling it forward. Don't do that. You're going to rip everything out. So watch your finger. You can feel the cells. There's a tendon that you can feel. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's a lot of feel to it, unfortunately. It's like you are basically a vascular surgeon. You're doing these things. You're going in. You're feeling it. And you can feel the aorta pulsating in front of you. Got that third retractor in. They're right in front of the cervix right now. You can see the cervix right there. The plane is right in front of the cervix. The aorta is behind the cervix. Get your first probe in. It's on the disc. Get your x-ray to make sure it's right where it is on the disc. You want to be in the anterior third of that disc. And put a guide wire in. You've localized it. Now you've localized your disc access exactly the way you want to be. And that's your disc access and it's all localized. Right? So once you've done that, you now you, you obviously want to do the, you want to keep going and do the discectomy at that level, right? And so now we are the third video. Let me give you that. Okay, and there we go. Let me do that. I'm going to run through this because th this is the actual video of that other patient. But I thought the access in front of the service was much better on this. So here's another incision. You see that? I can use that incision to put my hand in there, feel the service, feel the aorta, feel the front of the service. It's a clean areola plane that goes along. I can connect the two. So I know I'm always in front of the service and behind the aorta. It's no different than ECDF. I'm going to keep saying it. You feel the carotid, and you go there. You find that plane. We never dissect the carotid, do we? So it's the same thing. It's just a different concept. It's like lumbar ACDF. You get down there, same retractors. You pop in there a little faster. Here. Well, same thing. You pop the retractors till I get to the point where. So there's a lot of finger work here. And don't um, there, okay? So there it is. There's the sewers. You're right in front of it. That's where it, your, your uh, dilator, same way, goes in. Wires in there. Now dilators go in. You're watching every single thing there. There's nothing in your way. You look for the ureter. Look for a sympathetic chain. It's not in your way. It's clean. Keep sweeping it all out. Drop your dilators down. It's on a clean wish. Every single one of it. And it's a pure anti sewers approach. And there's absolutely no need to go through that sewers. We don't monitor. We do nothing. The guy just sits there. because Everybody else is using monitoring. I don't have a choice. He's sitting there. Patient's completely paralyzed. It makes it really easy on the sewers. And, um, and you drop your retractor down. And, and once you got there, then the rest of it is the regular discectomy we do for a lateral. I think many of you are quite familiar with. The retractor goes in, opens up. You're in there. I'll get to the point where we, we probably can see the, there you go. Let me go there. We put an anterior blade there to show the ALL. I always like to see the ALL. The other thing this has done for me is to place the prosthesis just behind the ALL that maximizes your lordosis. You want a cantilever kick up, right? So you want to put it just behind the ALL. So I know where the ALL is, I can see it. And I'm just behind it with the guide wire. And my annulotomy now will be right at that point. And there's nothing in my way. You cleaned it out, it's clear vision, what you're seeing. Now we'll take, a, uh, take an annulotomy blade, literally make a small half a centimeter cut. There's no box cut, there's no chisels, there's nothing, it's one slit. Next will come a carb. And on x-ray, I know exactly where I am. I'll get a quick shot. So that's all it is. It's one small slit. Next will come a carb. That's a one centimeter carb. Actually, it's less than one centimeter. It's about nine millimeters. And so once that is done, I'm purposely letting this run. This is probably a really important part. That's the carb. The carb now goes in. Again, a slit. Just opens it up. You're dilating it. You're progressively dilating each level. This saves you damaging the end plate. You start doing box cuts, you're going to take the end plate out. The entire surgery is absolutely useless the moment you damage the end plate. You achieve nothing. It's going to collapse on you. You lost your deformity correction. You pretty much lost everything. So that's why this becomes really critical. I don't know if you noticed how that went straight. See, that's how the tube is going. You have to make it orthogonal now to make it straight down the spine. Remember, I'm coming obliquely down to the spine. It's a pre psoas approach. You're not going straight down. The tube is coming at an angle to the spine put your instruments at an angle. You correct them. You make that orthogonal maneuver to correct it. The next is the ring curette. It goes through that same slit. Takes out the disc tissue. Every scrape is up and down. I have no rotary cutters. There are no rotary shavers. They will take off all the end plate. You just slide up and down on the thing. You're basically grating it like a cheese grater. You basically grate up and down. 
take out what you need to do, it just comes out. And once you've got that, your pituitary goes in and, and the next step you normally have is a rasp. I think a pituitary now is to take what you need to take out. Then will be a rasp to follow. Again, it's a straight rasp that takes out. I think next will be a rasp there. And then we have, I'll show you the two tools that are really, really useful. Uh, that should be the rasp or the pituitary. You go up ahead. That's a bigger carb, sorry. That is a bigger carb that extends it to basically 18 to 20 millimeters. That's the width of your prosthesis. You don't need one millimeter more. Things have to be line to line. So you do 18 to 20 millimeters, that's the carb. It slits it up, it opens it up exactly there. That carb's gonna go in that same spot. You're watching it go in, lay it exactly where you are. Every time the instruments go in, watch it. This is the other thing I watch people looking at the x-ray and they're trying to put it down. No, look down here. That bowel's gonna creep in on you. You gotta look down when you're putting your instrument. Once you're in, then look at the x-ray, you're all right. But don't look at the x-ray and start putting instruments in. You'll completely miss things. And we have actually have defended three bowel injuries now. We won all of them successfully, but everyone, that's how it happened. <laughs> you, know, you can see that's how it happened. They were not looking when they were going in. And usually catch something if you're not careful. So one, protect, you protect yourself like this so there's nothing to see. Other, always look when you're going in, clean it up and down. It's just being careful like any other surgery, right? If there's enough structures in here that will be damaged at some point or the other. And so that's again, pituitary suctions. There's a rasp. That's that straight rasp that goes in. It cleans all that out. And a little faster here. And basically, just, again, on x-ray, I'm watching the angle, by the way. The x-ray is there in the AP view. So I'm correcting the angles to make sure that I'm going along the end plates at all times. Again, every action is up and down scraping. It literally gets easier. greater. He's keeping on cleaning it up and down, up and down. Then the trial's going. Eight, 10, 12, keep building it up. You're just dilating that disc and working it. So you don't need box cutters here. You're dilating, the disc will move. Go ahead. Directly lateral, absolutely directly lateral. So if you notice, you're starting like this and I'm making it straight. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're going straight lateral. Otherwise, oh, otherwise you will go in the other foramen. No, no question about it. So you enter the disc and the moment you've entered it, make it straight. Don't try making it straight before, but you'll slip off the ALO. So you have to enter the disc first, that's the other thing. So make sure you entered it, look on the x-ray, and then start rotating it, but you're seeing it. I can see if I'm slipping out or not, I can see the ALO. So I'm watching the ALO there, right? And I protected it. So it's unlikely it's gonna slip, and that's the other reason to be on the left side. God forbid you were to slip, you're at least on the aorta and not on the IVC side. You do not wanna be on the right side. You 100% want to do this on the left side. And left is much, much safer. Like, I will not do this actually on the right side. So it's much better to do it on the left side. So anyway, once you've got all that, pretty much is after that, it is getting me, I guess. One more small thing to show you how you move to the next level. So you clean all that out, space was going, gets bigger and bigger, gets bigger and bigger. And then you then put your prosthesis in, which pretty much is a peak prosthesis. That's all the disc coming out. A peak prosthesis with the biologics. Uh, BMP three milligrams of RHBMP two goes in. That's on label, by the way, and I can say it. And a grafton putty that goes with it into the cage, and basically that, that's that's the cage, by the way. It is fully loaded with all the BMPs loaded in the cage. I don't put anything outside with grafton putty, DBM, augmented, packed in, put right in. Again, I can see that ALR at all times. Make sure my ALR is free. We'll quickly look at it again. I'm constantly looking to make sure the ALR is intact. Drop it down, that's intact. And now, this is the only maneuver I want to show you. It's done here. We just move now, literally, reduce that view and move along that plane to the next level. And back to the same thing. You're at three, four now. Sometimes with convex, you go to two, three. You created that corridor, and my finger already created it. It just moves up and down. But don't grate along the bone. You'll take the segment. You, you can't grate along the bone. You gotta come off a little bit, and you can just walk. You watch the sewers, I'm down to the next level. Neil, what are your thoughts on releasing the ALL? I was going to come to it. I think I've released in a year, I probably do one, maybe two. You don't need it in capital letters. I'm going to say it again and again. We'll show you case after case now. So we're done with all this. We go quick, go back to this. Uh, back to here. Where are we going? All right. Then you're gonna need something to take care of that. That's correct. Then you will need a prosthesis that you can hold in place. That's all. It can happen inadvertently, but that's the more reason to look at it. Which is another reason why I never liked the transverse. You never saw it so well. This, you clearly see it. 
But you're right, it can absolutely happen. If it happens, you need a prosthesis to keep it in, it'll fly out otherwise. So ultimately on x-ray, this is what it looks like. You're working the disc, you're working it, working it. You want to see these end plates move. See how these end plates move up. By the way, three, four was fused, that patient, remember? We never did it. I tried to say, forget it. I just went down, ignored it, just gone to the other levels, lift each level up, parallelize them, and that's how we get your prosthesis. Here's the phi one going in, same prosthesis. You can see that phi one lift, you get your lower doses, your correction, that's even where the way you can take it. So that's her post first stage. She's up, walking, no leg pain, and five by five motor power. So you know you got indirect decompression and you got a lot of coronal correction as well as sagittal correction. Her PILL is 13 now, just by doing this, from 51 to 13. She has no thoracic kyphosis. This patient, I swear five years ago, or maybe seven, 10 years ago, I would have done T2 to pelvis without even thinking about it. This would have been a T2 to pelvis, straightforward case every single day. There's no reason now looking at this x-ray to do a T2 to pelvis, right? For four years, we haven't done that. We've got 40 patients now. We're getting that paper out. So this is a T10 to pelvis now. Thursday, we'll navigate, put all our screws completely percutaneously. Not a single facet resected, no osteotomies, no SPOs, nothing. You contour the rod, derotate, translate, put the rod in, and get your reduction. You get about... 30% sagittal correction, more by putting the rod in. You can see the improvement. PILL went to nine now. Your L number of doses went increased, so it increases. Go ahead. S2 AI screws? No. They're all they're posterior inferior iliac screws, direct. Stop doing S2 LR iliac screws. They're totally percutaneous screws that go, they go low in the ilium. Can I show it on the AP there? They go low in the ilium, but they're actually in the ilium. They go directly in the ilium. I had two patients with S2L or iliac that went down the sacroiliac joint. And I hear you keep on taking x-rays then. It's very easy to slide down the SI joint. So you need multiple x-rays. This we do, no x-rays. There's nothing. It's completely free and it's the best particle screw you'll put in. Right down the iliac. If I have trouble, then I'll bring the teardrop view and have a look at it. If not, that's actually one of the easiest screws we put in. It's low down there. That's a direct inline screw. It lines up. And that's a coronal. So you can see the whole correction across the board. And so that gets you all the, because he's two years post-op, that's doing unbelievably well. So if, and, and this just goes on and on. The same protocol has worked for every single patient. In the end, they all look the same. Another patient, very similar, PILL 32, 50 degree curve. Here's, here's, here's the um, MRI, stenosis. Same thing, you can see these osteophytes. These osteophytes you can break. These are osteophytes that are fused. It's not a body that's fused. You can actually crack right through it. And we will attempt to crack it. It'll crack right through, bone density. And same thing, I calculated your mismatch. The same things, I want 32 degrees here. Again, you calculated it, and you, and you let the body do what it needs to do. And here's her again, PILL is four, right after the first stage. Again, her entire SVS is corrected. I don't need a T2 to pelvis. It stops a T10 to pelvis, there's no reason. She doesn't have persistent thoracic kyphosis. There's her pre-op, post first stage, and then and then navigate, put our screws in. By the way, that's a screw. It's totally, we don't even navigate. The only reason I navigate is to show people what we do. That screw I don't navigate, it's to get totally free hand. But it's going right down the PSIS, take your rod, bend it, contour it, same thing, reduce it, line it up, put it in there. And there's a lot of derotation, translational maneuver that occurs here in terms of using it. But you can see how much more lordosis we got with the rod. There's the intervening x-ray. You get, you get 30 to 40% more sagittal correction with the rod, 60% coronal correction with the rod. Everyone thinks the lateral does, and it's not. You need a lot of translational forces with these big deformities, and that's how it moves with the rod correction. And this is the biggest, one of the other, no, 47, same thing, same, same protocol, intervening x-ray, post-op x-ray. Four years out, intervening x-ray, post-op x-ray. It almost becomes mundanely routine for us now. And it works with all these pathologies as long as you plan it out. This is one of the biggest curves we've done, 101. Same protocol, again, into body spaces, lined it up and lined her up again. She's two years out. And all the pain, it's just a case after case. This is, the, this is a revision here. You can work your way up. So you ask me about ACR. The only time I'll do an ACR today is someone who's got a four to one fusion and three fours completely collapsed and kyphotic and flat back. So instead of doing a four PSL, you can do 3-4 ACR and SPO. You'll get the same correction. 
Same thing, you have a three to one fusion and two, three. The only two places that's useful is two, three and three, four. You start doing it one, two and 12, one, I'm gonna show you in a minute. You won't get anything. It doesn't correct. It, it works too high, ACR does not work. I'm gonna show you a case right now, it does not work. So here again, massive sagittal imbalance, bring it all back, correct it, realign it. No one, it, it, at some point it gets boring actually, the same thing goes on and on and on, same strategy. Just, just hands, <laughs> literally. No, it's the same. It's a, I'm, I'm just so used to doing deformity, how to bend the rod. And that's a great question I get asked all the time. And honestly, I never thought ever that would be a difficult problem, bending the rod. But I'm realizing more and more, I think it's a conceptual thing. But in the end of the day, the rod is exactly the same almost every time. It's where you want the patient to be at the end of the case. It does nothing matters. That's why Bendini is, is the most ridiculous idea I've seen on the surface of the earth, and I've said that openly. You cannot control a rod. The company knows, they don't even care. It, it cannot control a rod based on where you are. You have to take it to where it needs to go. So you have to bend the rod, and secondly, if you look at the bend the Bendini puts in, you got multiple coronal sagittal bends. I'd love to see a rod breakage rate. I want to see it down the line, if they're honest about it. It's going to fail. Sure. Lateral, lateral. Correct. We don't use any bend on the lateral, no. You don't need it. Lateral position, flat. The only time I put a kidney rest or something is to create some space so it's not sunken. Sometimes you're very sunken between the iliac crest and the rib. So I bring it up a little bit just to give myself some room. But you do not have to break the table, no. That's the other biggest advantage of the anti-service approach. You don't need to break it. The iliac crest is not in your way. You're in front of it. So, and because the electrus drops off, you have all the room to work yourself. Yeah. They're unlike the trans cells, when we had all that trouble, the iliac crest. Yeah. That's the difference. Go ahead. How much do you think you're going to save the amount of time? Two days. It's from Monday and Thursday, that's how it started. It's become Monday and Thursday forever now. Do you send them home or do you not? No, they stay. They stay in house. Usually Tuesday, they're up and walking. Just about, you're okay. They have some abdominal pain for sure. Maybe a little distension. Wednesday is when it's a good time to get the x-ray because even Tuesday, they're still hurting. They're kind of guarding the stuff a little bit. But Wednesday, they're really able to stand up straight, get a good x-ray. And then Thursday, it seems to be perfect. You could do Tuesday, Thursday, one day, but it's probably pushing it a little bit. But I mean, they got five levels, remember, so. And as far as the brace that you need, there's no Nothing. Brace Absolutely no brace. None of these patients ever get a brace. <clears throat> if I need a brace, they won't get surgery. There's something wrong. So I think that all comes in the planning. The only time I probably lose a brace is with minus... 2.5, put them on forte, and kind of I didn't like the, I got some collapse here or there, or I didn't get good end body, then I might brace them, but usually I don't. The forte has been huge. I'd rather put them on forte than brace them. Forte has been really helpful. So again, use this lateral, whatever. This is the piece that I talked to you about. So, had a T12 one and one two ACR. And you can see it doesn't correct, nothing happened. That's a post ACR, 12 one and one two. You don't get it, it just collapse right back. Because the body can't take 24 degrees, like 12, 1, and 1, 2. It wasn't even meant to take that. It wouldn't work unless you reset everything up. So ultimately, you have to go around, work around it. And we see this consistently, unfortunately. So if you're going to do it, do it at 2, 3, and 3, 4. It's a great procedure in place of a PSO, where in, in, you would have done a PSO otherwise. I think ACR is a great operation in that particular setting. Anyway, this is learning curve. I'll quickly go through it. It's a 100-case learning curve now. I'll come to that. Our experience is the same, about 100 cases when it started dropping. There's a great paper from Japan looking at every single ex uh, lateral approach they ever did, 2,000 cases. And same thing, if you look at institutions that did more than 100 cases, you can clearly see their complication rates are really low. As opposed to institutions that did less than 9 or less than 30, most low incidents, we are, majority of the complications are occurring there. So yes, there's a learning curve. How do you overcome that? I guess get the complication. I don't know. It's, it's going to be one of these things that we're going to have to proceed through. But I think you'll get there once you get just smarter and hopefully learn from everybody else. But it is about, I'd say, reduce that. You're looking at definitely, there is a learning curve without a question. That's just our whole new protocol. It's all anti service now. This is a 10 year paper we published, but all, all the data. You can say experience made it better, sure. Fair criticism. But I do think the anti service approach, at least for me at least, I've not seen a quadriceps palsy as yet. We have four. I don't want to ever see it again, one again. And I had one on my 278th case when I thought I knew, I knew everything. Perfectly normal. Monitoring was normal. 
beautiful case, absolute picture perfect. Woke up zero by five in recovery quads. There's no inclusion. That's what I said. I'm done. Absolutely done. In 2011, we changed. Started moving anterior. It didn't make any sense. It's the best thing I ever did. So that's all I have to say about I'll, I'll, You'll never find me doing a transverse ever again. I'll predict this and I've said this five years from now to be obsolete. We will be looking at it as a historical operation. The transverse procedure. Go anti source, call it what you want. It's not about nomenclature or anything. Just go anti source. It's there. There's a clean plane for us to take. Uh, you can see they have the same difference, statistically significant difference, sensory nerve and psoas. In trans psoas as opposed to anti psoas, uh, peritoneal lacerations were more in the anti psoas when they were moving the peritoneum, obviously. So they got a little bit more, uh, and the ureteral injury was more in anti psoas. But you have to be careful. You sweep the ureter with the peritoneum and make sure it's not in your plane. So you do need to do that. Uh, but that's where you are today. It's all safe, no osteotomies, 12 degree cages. You do not need an AML. In virgin scoliosis, look at the intervening X-ray, aggressive contour it, and at the end of the day, it was you know avoid three-column osteotomy. It's not a numbers game. Don't chase it. And reserve ACR for that distal lumbar fused patient with PJK, four to one or three to one. That's a perfect ACR case that works really, really well. But bottom line is this: right, you have to plan it, select it, plan it, follow the protocol, and execute it. Thank you.